That's it. Hmm. We'll continue. Oh. All right, um, I wanna welcome all of you to this uh, Polar Connect webinar today on July 26, 2021. Um, we are very excited to be um, hearing from the High Arctic Change team that's located in Svalbard, Norway. We'll hear more about where they are exactly. Um, today we are um, going to be mostly hearing from our Polar Trek alumnus, uh, Mark Goldner. And uh, he will also introduce us to his research team here in a little bit. Um, before he gets started and uh, tells us all about the exciting things that they've been doing there in, um, in Svalbard, um, I wanted to give a little bit of background as to why Mark is presenting and why we call it this program Polar Trek. So Mark is an alumni of the Polar Trek program, which is teachers and researchers exploring and collaborating in I think it was what 2011 was your That's right. Yep. Yeah, 2011. He had uh, the good fortune of accompanying Dr. Uh, Julie um, Brigham Gretty, who you'll um, hear from in a little bit. Um, and of course, she's uh, the head of this expedition as well. And they went to the same place. So um, we're going to be hearing, I think, a little bit about what has happened since uh, Mark was there in 2011 and the changes that they've seen. Um, with the science and with the area. And Polar Trek um, is a program that's funded by the National Science Foundation. And we put teachers like Mark with researchers like Dr. Julie Brigham Gretty um, so that they can do hands-on science and um, sure. learn more about what's happening in the Arctic and the Antarctic regions. Um, Judy Fonstock, who's my colleague here, we both work for ARCUS, which is a nonprofit that's based in Fairbanks, Alaska. And we support researchers like Julie Br Brigham Gretty and others to help communicate science and collaborate about polar science um, uh, with, with the public and with other researchers. So with that, um, the, oh, uh, as we go along, I think people were asking about how to use um, video and um, and audio. So today, while Mark is talking, we hopefully you can keep your video on, that's fine. Um, but please mute yourself, um, your microphones, so we don't get to lots of background noise. And then if you have questions as we go along, you can type them in the chat window. And uh, one of Mark's team member, Xander, is going to be following the chat. And he and the team will um, try to address questions as we go along. And then if you have questions at the end, we'll also, um, you feel free to ask them live as well. So Judy and I will prompt you on how that works at the end. Um, and this event is being archived or recorded um, and we will have an archive. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, we understand, um, we'll send out the link to everybody that's registered. I think that's it. Um, so yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Mark and uh, welcome everyone. All right. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Judy. So before we start, I just want to thank, I have a lot of people to thank and uh, people and organizations. I'll, I'll do it quickly. But um, first, Julie Brigham Gretty, um, who is an incredible scientist and overall amazing human being. Um, thank you for allowing me to be uh, part of your scientific work and for teaching me so much about science and how science is done. And you'll meet Julie in, in just a few minutes. So thank you. This has been a real, an amazing opportunity for me and, and a gift. Um, Janet and Judy from Polar Trek, thank you. You've provided me with so much educational and logistical support over the over the years and giving me opportunities that as a as a teacher I never knew existed. So thank you. Um, we have to of course thank you know this is a doing research like this is expensive and I have to thank all of the organizations, primarily the National Geographic Explorers uh, program who is funding the research. Um, you know, and so that's really, really important. Um, my participation is being funded in part by the Brookline Education Foundation, the National Education Association, and the Heath School PTO. So I want to thank all those organizations for, for, you know, taking a risk on all of us and doing this. So our team, who again, you'll meet, you can see us in our, in our really like, really awesome looking survival suits here. There's me, uh, Julie Brigham Gretty next to me. Kelly McKeon and Xander Kirshen. Uh, Kelly is a graduate student um, and Xander is finishing up his undergraduate both from UMass Amherst. So uh, where are we? We're in a place called Neolisand, which is in the archipelago of Svalbard, which is uh, a territory owned by Norway. 
And uh, you can see, I think you guys can see my cursor moving, right? So this is Svalbard, it's just to the east of Greenland. We'll zoom in here. Um, and then as you zoom in further, this is exactly where we are. We're about 700 miles south of the North Pole. And uh, Nialison was set up by the Norwegian government as a, an international research base. So there are, um, what's, what's interesting about the climate here is that even though we're so far north, 79 degrees latitude, it actually stays ice-free in the summer, which at, on the coast, so that, you know, the interior is all covered with ice sheet, but the coasts are um, for now open in the summer. So it's a convenient place to do, to do high Arctic research. Um, so right now there's about probably about 180 to 100 scientists from all over the world doing really interesting research projects. There are other researchers like us studying glaciers. There are people studying, there's a large group of people studying birds, uh, atmospheric scientists. There's even a group studying kelp. Um, so all kinds of interesting projects. And one of the amazing things about being here is the, the opportunity for scientists to learn from each other and to collaborate with each other. Um, so it's really, you know, for me as a teacher to be able to sort of witness that and be part of it is really, really special. Um, this is what it looks like, um, and sorry, I've got my notes here. Um, so this, you can see the top left is sort of a view of the base. It's set up like a little Norwegian village. It's very cute. Um, some of the buildings are dormitory space, like where we sleep. There's a, a, a really nice cafeteria. The food here is excellent, actually. So they, they feed us, they house us. Um, there's logistical support. We're actually in a building owned by their Norwegian Polar Institute, which is kind of one of the main organizations here. And they're providing us with office space, a boat, um, rifle training, survival suits. Um, so they provide all that support, really, really great people, all to help scientists do their work. Um, but in addition, roaming, you know, it's, this is it. Like you see, there's a few more buildings that didn't show up in this picture, but like, that's it. We're kind of in the middle of nowhere. So there's wildlife all over the place. There's reindeer. Uh, there's a great shot here of a fox and some Arctic geese. So you see these little scenes in nature kind of right there outside your window. And on the bottom left, I've circled, there's actually a polar bear and her cub, um, which were, they are probably about, I don't know, a kilometer away. I have this great camera with a nice zoom, so I was able to, to take a photo of it. But you know, it's all there, and that's that's a really neat part of, of this. And what's neat is actually you can't quite see it in the photo, but um the fox and I think at least one of the goose are like tagged. So that you know the wildlife biologists are studying these animals. You see them walk around with their tags and collars and stuff. So so that's that's kind of cool. Um here is a map of the fjord showing Nialisand over on the left. And every day we take our boat and drive over to one of three glaciers, well, which we're studying in these two boxes right here. It's about 10 miles to the glacier face, depending on weather and ice conditions could take, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes longer if it's really rough. Um, but that's, that's what we do every day. Um, this is what our commute looks like. Um, it takes us again to one of the glaciers. You see two of the glaciers behind us. Um, and we're actually driving back at this point. So this is our view, it's, it's, it's not too bad. Um, and yeah, it's really like, it's amazing to be out here. Every single day we get to see this incredible view. Um, and just for scale, we are at least, I don't know, two kilometers away from, from the glacier right now. So you know, these glaciers are really massive. They're probably um, 150 plus feet high when you get right up to them. So uh, really, really spectacular. Um, these are some of the things we'll see on our daily commute um, while we're on while we're out there when we're driving there on our way back while we're conducting research. Uh, lots of wildlife again, hundreds of birds on a daily basis. Um, starting to, I'm not a birder, but I'm starting to learn some of the different species. Uh, recently, we've been seeing a lot of seals haul themselves out onto the ice flows, and that's that's you know really really special. Um, and we will regularly, several times a day, see icebergs calving off the glacier. Um, this was actually, this is a photo I took today um, from a video. We were quite close and saw a dramatic calving event. And by the way, I'm, I, I've got a great YouTube channel with lots of videos of calving events and other things. So you can you can check that out. Um, so I'll me, before we dive into the research, let me talk for a minute about what a glacier is because there may be some folks here who don't, don't really know what a glacier is. And so and we're gonna be talking a lot about them. So we'll just take a minute. So a glacier is literally a, a flowing river of ice, um, it, which exists in places where the snow that forms in winter does not melt completely in the summer. Um, so over hundreds or thousands of years, as the snow piles up uh, into a thick, dense mass of ice, 
And from its own weight, it just flows downhill, you know, just like water does. But of course, ice is a solid. So as it's flowing, it's cracking, it's grinding, it's, it's deforming and um, enormous amounts of pressure. And, and so this process is incredibly dynamic, which is what we're studying here. And as it's doing, you'll notice that these glaciers are not, it's not nice, pure ice. It's really dirty. And so it's, as it's flowing downhill, it's grinding up the bedrock uh, beneath it. Um, and creating all of the sediment that is what we're particularly interested in and we're gonna be talking about in a minute. The glaciers that we're studying are called tidewater glaciers, which means they flow all the way to the ocean. And so, um, and the, the glacier that we're looking at over right now, a Kronobrin glacier flows at a rate of one to two meters per day. So as it's flowing, as that ice hits the, the ocean, it becomes unstable and pieces fall off and we call those pieces icebergs and we call that the calving of icebergs. So that's that's my little introduction on glaciers, and we can obviously answer more questions in the chat or after, during our Q&A period if you have them. All right, why are we doing this research? What's it all about? So it's really related to climate. It's all about climate change, and we really want to understand how climate change is affecting glaciers in the Arctic. And we know that climate change is an increasingly alarming problem. Um, here are just four headlines from the last few weeks. I just, you know, it wasn't hard to find them. Um, whether it's flooding, incredible heat waves in the Northwest, wildfires, right? These are problems that are either directly caused or are made worse because of climate change and the impacts are felt worldwide. So what's the connection to the Arctic? Um, so I'm actually gonna hand it off to, to Julie to give us a sense of what we're seeing in the Arctic and why it matters to those of us who live in the mid-latitudes. Yeah, or, or the um, sideways. Okay. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you today. So it's really true that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there because the Arctic is changing very rapidly. It's actually changing three times faster than the climate of the rest of the world. And so we see these remarkable changes as a product of the way, of course, humans are, are treating the environment. So we really are looking at the bellwether here in Svalbard about what's happening all across the Arctic. And you know, one of the most dramatic um, elements of change is particularly the loss of sea ice. Uh, in the, in the left-hand part of this, of this figure, you'll see a diagram from 1988. That's um, very close to the time when I was doing my dissertation work or the 40 years ago. And we were getting stuck in the ice along the coast of Barrow, Alaska, because there was so much sea ice in my little uh, inflatable you know, Zodiac. But today I wouldn't have any trouble at all because the sea ice is so retracted very much. And we're losing about 13% per decade. So every 10 years, 13% less ice. So this is a pretty dramatic change that we see. And it's kind of the most common thing that people can measure and that you often hear about in the newspapers. Another thing, which we call ocean acidification, is we call the evil twin of climate change. This has to do with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere mixing with water to make carbonic acid. For example, when you drink a Coca-Cola or any carbonated beverage, you're combining CO2 with some kind of water and you're actually making an acid. And that acid in the water actually decreases the changes the pH in the ocean, it makes it very difficult for microfossils or small fossils like uh, this pteropod here to exist. So that really in, impacts the food chain in, uh, in the oceans, but particularly in the Arctic where the water is colder and it can hold more CO2. If you've ever opened a warm can of Coca-Cola in your car, like I did one time, I opened the Coca-Cola, it was warm and it sprayed all over the roof of my car because the gas wanted to get out. But if I open a cold Coca-Cola or maybe a cold bottle of champagne, you know that the bubbles stay in solution. So you know that principle and that's what's happening with the ocean is it's getting more acidic with the uh, increase in CO2 in the, in the oceans. And of course, what we're looking at here are glaciers that are retreating. And this is a microcosm of what's happening uh, here in Svalbard of, of what's happening in Antarctica in the lower right-hand column. And of course, across 
parts of Greenland. These are the two big elephants in the room and global change and co of course causing uh, changes in global sea level. So again, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic because what's happening here with, with particularly the melting of the ice sheets, like we're seeing in Svalbard, this is increasing sea level everywhere in the world. And so that's one of the consequences of change that we're, that we're quite concerned about. Um, and so now I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Xander, who is a senior major at uh, University of Massachusetts. And he's gonna talk to you about the extent of the ice and this wonderful map that he's made this week. Hello everyone. Um, yeah, so here's a map showing the extent of the ice margin at the glaciers we are studying, and it extends from 1978 to the present. And so here shown with the red arrow, you can see the 2011 glacial margin, which is the last time Mark was here. So you can see that in the last 10 years, the margin has retreated, depending on where um, along the glacier, it's retreated anywhere from two to maybe four kilometers back. So the retreat is accelerating. Um, and one of, the, one of the drivers of this retreat, as discussed earlier a little bit, is that the warm Gulf Stream water coming up is entering the fjord and causing increased melting. So one of the main objectives of our project is to better understand subglacial jets and sediment plumes, as well as understand when and if Atlantic water is entering the fjord. So if we take a look here at the bottom uh, cartoon, you can see the glaciers on the right, and you can see a subglacial jet entering into the water. Um, and so that's fresh water and it's less dense. So it rises up the glacier front um, above the dense salty ocean water. Um, and one of the really cool things about these jets is that you can actually spot them in front of the glacier, depending on where the birds are, because these jets come shooting up and they stun the zooplankton and that makes them easy prey for the birds. So the top right photo shows some of the images that we see of the birds preying on the zooplankton. And um, one of the other cool features you can see caused by uh, glacial jet erosion is these tunnels or caves over here on the upper left. Um, so those are just some of the features that you can see caused from these subglacial jets. And um, so here's an example of a photo that we took <clears throat> that we took just the other day. I think Mark took this photo. And this is a sediment plume coming out from one of the glaciers we are studying. So you can see there's a clear difference between the ocean water and the fresh sediment rich water coming out over, over um, into the fjord. So they can be quite, quite large. And then you can also see one back here. So there can be multiple plumes within one glacial margin. And another cool feature that you can see um, in the icebergs actually is something called a runnel. And these are formed, if we take a look at this schematic down in the bottom left, these are formed when a end glacial drainage or subglacial jet enters into the water and then quickly rises up once again because it's fresh and uh, less dense than the ocean water. So it shoots right up the front of the glacier and erodes um, the glacier in a line. And then it floats out as a sediment plume. Um, and in the upper right corner, there's a, um, there's a cartoon showing kind of how the warm Atlantic water can enter a fjord. And um, we take some measurements to try to understand if and when this warm water is entering the fjord. So, um, so here is an example of one of the icebergs that we've seen um, with these lines that I was describing, these runnels caused by this um, erosion of these jets rising up the front of the glacier. And 
this, I just turned this picture around a little bit to show how this iceberg could have been um, oriented on the front of the glacier. So it could have been oriented like this and the jets would rise up vertically eroding the glacier front. Um, and so some of the ways we um, measure these plumes is using an instrument called a CTD. And that stands for, um, that stands for, um, con uh, con yeah, sorry, conductivity, uh, see, uh, temperature and depth. And what that tells us is information, obviously about temperature, but it also tells us information about salinity and turbidity, which is the cloudiness of the water. Um, so how we use this instrument is we lower it down on a winch, as you can see in the left photo, and it takes two measurements every second. And um, so it gives us kind of a profile of these values with depth. And then another uh, technique we use is water sampling. So we water sample at different depths and that's shown in the right image. Um, and that tells us about sediment concentration at different depths, which can help us understand where in the water column the sediment is. So oftentimes you see in the top part, it's very sediment rich and in the bottom part, there's less sediment. Um, so now I'm going to hand it off to Kelly to talk about some bathymetry data. Okay, thanks, Sander. Um, yeah, so another technique that we use um, to study glaciers and the sediment that's coming off of them is this sonar device that does bathymetry. So bathymetry is basically a map of the sea floor that shows the different depths. Um, so you can see that on the right here and in this photo, um, purple is deeper and red is shallower. And the way that we do this is by towing around this device that you can see on the left side of this picture here, um, which is sonar. So it sends a sound wave down to the bottom of the ocean. And then um, using the amount of time that it takes for that wave to bounce off the bottom and reach the um, transducer that's attached to the boat, we can tell the depth of the water. Um, and knowing that depth helps us learn um, different things about the glacier. So um, the glacier is uh, putting off sediment. So when we know how much uh, depth we have in the water, we can sort of see how much sediment has accumulated there. And that's important because this is new ocean floor. Like it used to be covered in a glacier and now it's open. So knowing how deep the water is, is important for navigation, but also learning uh, where sediment is coming off the glacier and previous extents of the glacier um, can be seen in these bathymetry maps. And I'm gonna give it back to Mark now. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly and Xander uh, and Julie. And I think, you know, one of the things you can see is like, I am really, really fortunate and, and super lucky to be with these incredible people who are, you know, we're, we're a great team. And um, it's just, I'm learning, I think we're all learning a lot from each other. So it's great. So I, I have what I think is the coolest job of the team, which is flying a drone. And so this kind of fell in my lap as, as this project sort of came together in June. And Julie asked me if I'd be interested in flying a drone, which is something I'd never done until June. Um, now I have a drone and I've been flying it. And it's, it's an incredible tool because it allows you to, to take photo and video you know, from places that you can't access by yourself. And so glaciers are, you know, again, we we could spend hours talking about glaciers, but they're, you know, you can't get real close to a glacier. You know, we, we're sort of limited to maybe a hundred yards or so from the face of a glacier, depending on how active it is. Because, you know, as I said, these, the glacier face, hard to get a sense of scale, but the face of the glacier is well over a hundred feet high. Um, and ice is coming off all the time. And these are, it's not just like, it's not, this isn't like snow falling off. These are huge building size pieces of ice. You know, these are rocks falling off and, you know, and so, not to mention the waves that they create when they fall into the water. So you can't get very close to them. Um, so how do you study that if you don't, you know, if you can't get close to it? So the drone is this incredible tool. And so you can see in these, these are just two of the, I have now like hours of drone footage, um, which I'm trying to put together. Again, if you 
I'll, I on my in my blog, there's lots of links to the videos and to my YouTube channel, which now has a lot of this. But here's just two quick images. I think they'll help show you what what we're able to do. So you can see those sediment plumes that Xander and Kelly were talking about. From the air, you can get a lot of information um, about where they are. And you know, we've only been here really for a few weeks, but you know, even on a day-to-day -day basis, we start to see some changes in where these sediment plumes are, which give us information about where these subglacial jets, uh, where is the water exiting from the glacier? And what does that tell us about how, how the dynamics of the glacier are working? There's, a, there's actually a group, uh, another group that's been here that's been monitoring a lake that is forming way up on one of these glaciers. Um, and in the bottom corner, sorry, the bottom, bottom image here, you can see this cave feature where they expect that when this lake drains, water is going to come rushing out of it. So we've been able to sort of monitor that with, with the drones as well. So it's really been a remarkable tool um, for that. Um, the other, excuse me, the other thing that I'm able to do, this isn't really related to the research, but for me as a science teacher, it's really incredible, is I'm able to take video and images of, of glacial features and to really understand how glaciers work from a sort of geologic perspective. So for example, you can see on the top picture, this, this long hill is called a moraine. And, um, and you know, all over New England, uh, this is probably what New England looked like at the end of the last ice age, right? As the glaciers are retreating. And so there's all kinds of hills and, and other features are left behind. And we can see these, these there as well. So, so that's really exciting to be able to do that. Um, and for me as a, as a science teacher to learn about that and hopefully to, to provide educational tools um, that, that will be useful for others. So let me just wrap it up. I want, I want to make sure we leave lots of, of time for questions. Um, so, you know, for me personally, what, what I think has been really dramatic, it's, it's a real, I keep using the word gift, but I really do feel like I have been given a gift. You know, first of all, Thanks to, to Janet and Julie to be able to come here in 2011 and be part of this incredible research experience, but then to be able to come back um, and to see, to come back to the same location and to participate in very similar research. And in this in particular, to be able to bear witness to what climate change is doing to this incredibly um, precious landscape and to, 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 to witness what's going on. So this image right here, which I took with the drone, um, if you see my cursor over here, where, where it is right here is where the 10 years ago, this is, would have been the edge of the glacier. And so we are now in all of this open ocean that was all ice just 10 years ago. And so that's, it's really profound to be, to go to that place and to realize that's where we are and to see the changes that are occurring. Um, so it's important for me personally, and I hope that, you know, from this experience, um, you know, not only the scientific value of doing this kind of data collection, but also the, the, the important outreach that needs to happen about climate change itself and that we really need to, that th this is a call to action, I think for me personally, but for all of us to, as, we, as we go through this. Um, and I think it's really important to leave with, not with, you know, this is a depressing topic to think about what's going on, but to also realize that there's a lot we can do because it's not too late. And although changes are occurring and we are seeing them um, this summer, certainly really dramatically, it's not too late. And there's a lot of things we can do. And so to the, to the young people out there, you know, it's, it's um, you know, we're depending on you <laughs> uh, to, to really uh, act and speak up and, and make sure that, uh, the, the us the older generation really listen to you and 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 make make important decisions of course there's things we do in our personal lives whether it's changing the way we get our electrical power changing the way we eat the way we drive those are important choices but most importantly it's not just about the individual choices it's really a systemic problem and we need to we need to vote we need to elect the people who are going to to really do the right thing so that we um so that we can really turn this thing around. And, and that's, I think that's a really important message to, to bring across. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll end with that. And just a quick thank you again to, um, to everybody who helped make this happen. Most importantly, to the National Geographic Explorers Program that, that, that funded the research, um, the Brookline Education Foundation and the National Education Association that funded my participation here, as well as a small grant from the Heat School PTO. So I wanna thank all of those groups. Polar Trek, which has provided the support for us tonight, as well as, you know, helping me, you know, this amazing platform for the blog, which is not something I could have done on my own. So thank you for that and for supporting me, not just 10 years ago, but in different projects throughout the last 10 years. And of course, 
UMass Amherst, which makes this all happen with these folks here. So anyone else we need to thank? All of you for coming, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and the archive will be available. So lots and lots of questions. So um, we can certainly answer questions through the chat, but I don't know, Janet, how you wanna, how we wanna do the Q and A part here, but I'll- Well, I think yeah. uh, let's just start with people that have posted in the chat. So I know that uh, uh, your team is probably watching this as well, but, uh, and I'll mark, maybe stop sharing so we can uh, see all sure, of you. Okay. Good idea, okay. And if something comes up, you can reshare. Um, so from Lisa, uh, so she says, obviously you are documenting dramatic change due to global warming and climate change. Do you see any reason for hope? You know, I'll answer, but I, I also, I think um, the rest of the team can answer as well. Here, we're in this conference room here. Julie, do you want to answer that or? Yeah, there's, I think there's there's uh, really a lot of room for hope because uh, despite what you might hear on the popular news, I mean, uh, locally all across the country and across the world, people are changing the way they treat the environment. And we just need to um, um, see more of that. It's gotta be faster, it's more urgent. Uh, and I am optimistic because, um, uh, the, the problems are so great. The summer has been very um, symptomatic from people drowning in subways in China to massive fires. I mean, we were really seeing the effects and this is a wake up call to everyone to um, start to act. So I'm optimistic because while it takes a while to get going, I think um, we're on the right track. So I am very hopeful and it's certainly a lot more fun to be hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> True. Thanks, Julie. Um, uh, Henry is asking, how many miles of glaciers do you predict will be left in 10 years? I think it's a, it's a hard question to answer because it, it, it depends on a lot of factors, right? Are we going to continue in the same trajectory, right? Um, with terms of emissions, are we going to start to slow that down? Um, so certainly, I, I don't know if I can answer, the, I don't know if anybody can answer this the question yeah. specifically, but no, certainly. I, I think, so in the next 10 years, we, we've already kind of baked in the change that's gonna happen. I think what we need to do now, any changes we happen now are gonna be longer term. The glaciers here, particularly those that are in contact with the ocean will continue to retreat. The same in Greenland and the water worry is also Antarctica. Um, uh, some of the glaciers here that are already up on land are stabilizing a little bit, um, but I think we're going to continue to see more retreat because we honestly have not turned the corner on climate change yet. And the earth is a slow train that needs to be slowed down. It takes a while to slow that system and, and change and pivot in a new direction. Okay. Um, so from Regina, are the glaciers and glacier retreat being monitored throughout the year? Regina. Yes, there, there, <laughs> there are people who are doing, I mean, there's a lot of different projects going on. I mean, we're just, this is just one small project. Um, there, are, there are folks doing a lot of work with um, time-lapse photography, for example. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a group that's, that's studying a, a land terminating glacier just outside the, um, the research base here and they're putting in, they're using electrical resistivity in the ground to try to monitor what's happening to um, how the permafrost around the glacier is reacting to that. So there's a lot of interesting experiments just right here. And this is just one location right. uh, worldwide. So. And, and NASA, NASA, yeah. our own NASA has um, satellites circling the globe, monitoring ice sheets all over the globe. So um, we, we actually see some hardware around here from NASA. So um, it's all being monitored and, and we're a big, big, pro, big part of that operation to, to monitor and, and, and watch what's happening. All right. 
Yeah, and we've been fortunate to have some polar trek educators with some of those NASA scientists as well. Um, from Chris, many climate scientists say we have already reached the tipping point, e.g. the dire effects of climate change will keep accelerating. Have you seen that phenomena in your work at the station? Please describe. Thank you. And I think you touched on this, but if there's anything else you want to add. I mean, again, this is probably a question for Julie, but I think certainly, like the you know the the retreat of the ice sheets. I'm sorry, the retreat of the of the glaciers is is documented as Xander nicely put together in in, in the map. Um, so certainly, that's the work that that is being done here. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but yeah. So yeah, how about um, with the? Uh, have you talked to any of the um, animal scientists or people looking at seals or birds? Has that changed as well since uh, you know, say, year two thousand eleven? Yeah. So so one thing is happening. There's a lot less sea ice here. Um, the sea ice was pretty. You know, in the winter time, would fr the whole fjord was freeze over as of. 2005, 2006, and then it was open. It didn't freeze over for many, many, many years. And this year, because of the cooler temperatures, they actually had the fjord for the first time uh, in 15 years almost freeze over. So there was a little bit of a change. And we're also seeing that in the water temperatures. It's, it's a small perturbation. What does it mean long-term? But um, when you don't have sea ice, it changes the ecology it changes the kelp and the algae and all the uh, eco parts of the marine ecosystem here. So there are a lot of people here studying those changes because of the opening uh, of the fjord and also the lack of sea ice that's happening. Well, there's also the, I think there's the lack of sea ice. There's also the lack of, of icebergs, right? So that, I mean, there's, it's interesting to think about animals that depend on icebergs, whether it's, and I think, I think Charlotte asked this question also about, um, Who's who's signed in as Henry? I think um, you know, um, like seals, for example, haul themselves out partly for, as I as I understand, for temperature regulation, also for for um, for giving birth. So without the protection of of icebergs, that could be a problem for them. There are I've been I read last night about bird, there are certain bird species that nest in icebergs, right? They nest in the in the dirty parts of icebergs where there's sediment sort of stuck in the iceberg um, because it's safer for them. They're you know they're, they're they're not being uh, preyed upon by foxes and, and other types of animals on the iceberg. So what happens to those animals if the, like for example, the glaciers that we're studying will retreat before too long, they'll retreat up into the land. They'll no longer be tidewater glaciers. So they'll still be there. There'll still be plenty of ice, but they won't be releasing ice into the ocean. They'll just be melting on land. So what happens to animals that depend on icebergs if, if those icebergs are, are no longer there? So. Um, a, a question I think from family member here is thoughts about how you would share this um, hmm. since you did it in such a good way for non-science people, how, do. how do others share with the general public, politicians and schools? What are your tips? I don't know, do, you, do you guys have any? I'll pan over to the students. Have any thoughts? Put you on the spot. <laughs> I mean, I, I no, I, I think it's, I think I'll, I'll, for all of us, it's really about taking every opportunity possible to communicate what we're seeing, putting a real uh, voice on that, and making it real, and also making it clear how each town, city, county, uh, whatever urban area is affected, and um, talking to them locally because what hap what what matters to politicians is what's happening locally and how is it impacting businesses and, and people and their lifestyles. And so that radiates out at the county state um, level, regional level uh, to the whole country. So um, uh, that's really important start. You know, the old saying is think locally or uh, act locally, think globally. I think that's really the, the answer there. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I think, the, I mean, the other piece that I, I hope we can contribute to this is, um, you know, one of the cool things about having the drone footage and all the video that we're taking is, is that we are hoping that we can help document some of this stuff in ways that, that non-scientists can understand. So it's, it's, you know, my piece in this is it's not just a science 
research project, it's also an outreach project. And so hopefully if you, any of you on this call are interested in communicating with other people, you know, it's those concrete examples that, that can connect to people, you know, whether it's, it's seeing the pictures of marine animals or seeing um, icebergs calving or just seeing the landscapes, hopefully that helps trigger something in people that helps make that concrete connection. And then the complex science is something they can latch onto because they have that concrete visual, let's say. So um, I, see, I see a question from my student Wally right here. Um, because of retreating glacier, able to see different marks on the rocks that the glacier once flowed through? And the answer is yes, we see that all, the, all over the time, which is both on one level, it's like a little bit depressing to say like, oh, the glacier was here 10 years ago and now it's just rocks. On the other hand, as a, as a sort of student of geology, it's kind of cool to see, um, to see the stuff that we've learned about in geology, in seventh grade science, let's say, about what happens when glaciers flow across a landscape, to literally see, like Wally might remember in seventh grade, they had an opportunity to go look at a place where you could see glacial scarring, which is where the, the sediment in the bottom of the glacier, let's say the rocks that it's holding, are actually grinding across the bedrock and you can literally see scarring. Today, actually, we were doing some, I, I took the drone up to look at some glacial scarring from a glacier, from a region that was glaciated just like 10 or 20 years ago. And so you can literally see that. We can see that kind of evidence right there. Um, I don't think I have images right here to show you, but I, I you know, that's something I, I will make available to people certainly from here. So. So that's pretty cool to see that. All right, Regina is asking more uh, specifics about your drone. I have a Mavic 2 Pro. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> it is not waterproof. So um, yes, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it, it, I, we were talking about this before with, with Janet and Judy before the call started. It's, it's an amazing technology. You can you fly this thing with a joystick using my iPad as a, as a screen to watch where I'm going. And it's, it's, um, it's like going in a little virtual reality world. You fly up and you're using the drone's camera to sort of see where you are. And it's remarkably stable. The, you know, the, the, I, I can take, I can, I can have this thing hover um, in midair for quite some time while I take some, like pan around or, or take some photos. Um, it's, 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 I, I'm amazed at the technology. It's incredible. Yes. Um, yes, Janet. It's, it's one of those times where I was like, I wish I had been a gamer because learning how to like using all these little joysticks, I'm, I'm not very good at it. Like I have to do a lot of editing out all the like mistakes I make where I'm like, Oh, went the wrong way. Um, and one of the challenges of flying the drone is flying. We're, we're doing a lot of flying from a boat. And the way the drones work is it sets a home point on the uh, using the GPS on the drone, and then it flies back to home. And um, if the boat moves, then you have to guide it back, and you can't have a flight home. And I almost had a disaster last week, but I was able to uh, to avert that. But so it's an interesting challenge, and yeah, learning how to use that. So I see Jeffrey is is already trying to leverage this into a career as a drone pilot. So good, good Jeffrey, go for it. Um, so no, there, it's, it's an amazing technology. I mean, 10 years ago, this really wasn't, I mean, there were drones, but you, you know, they weren't commercially available like this, you know? So it's really, it's really a remarkable thing that, a remarkable, you know, it's fun, but it's also a great tool. So I could go, I could drone, I could drone on and on. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, um, is there anybody out there that wants to ask questions from LaSalle or others that um, are in big groups? Anything too, even if it's about like what yeah. it's like up here. So, cause it's a really, this is a really different place to be. Nope. <laughs> so bashful. Yeah. What's for dinner? You know, Lisa, what's really cool. I'm, I happen to be a vegan. Um, I was, I wasn't sure what it was going to be like, and they have, I have not gone hungry. They have, um, it's cafeteria style. The cooks are incredible. Um, there's always a vegan option. Um, and somehow they're getting fresh fruit and vegetables up here. I mean, no, they're, they're shipping stuff up from, from the mainland, but mm -hmm. it's, it's really good food. So, um, I'm, I think I've gained some weight actually. So, um, all right. There's a question from Nicholas. Is the, is the Arctic Institute of North America still involved in polar research? What, what is that? The Arctic, the Arctic Institute of North America. Is it still involved in polar research? Uh, yes, 
Yes, they are. And they're um, certainly operating the journal uh, Arctic. And um, certainly a lot of people publish in that journal. So I think it's based out of Calgary, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, yes, they're still very active. Uh, they've had a very long history, probably over 50 years. Um, so still very active, yes. That's good because I worked for them probably 50 or 60 years ago. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, I see Nico has a question. That's, that's is it there is Nicholas. Um, what do you predict will happen to the glacier in further years? I mean, I think what we what we predict is that within a short time, it's it's pretty close to the the well, three glaciers we're studying. One has already come out of the ocean and is um, is no longer. It, it's sort of on the edge of being no longer a tidewater glacier. Um, and the other two will probably, I don't know, what do you think, Julian, about 10 years? The other two will probably, within the next 10 years, will probably retreat out of the ocean. So they'll still be there. There'll still be lots of ice, but they will no longer be um, tidewater glaciers. So that's, you know, I think in terms of stopping it, it's it's the same answer about stopping all of the other issues around global warming slash climate change. Um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, you ask, is it possible to help as an individual or family? You know, it's it's one of those things where it's like every little thing you do is important, um, but it's also, we can't rely only on, you know, if I drive an electric car and become a vegan, that's great, but that's not really gonna solve the problem. What's gonna solve the problem is systemic, systemic change, right? We need as a society to, to figure out how to run our society in a way that is not, uh, polluting and not, you know, not extracting resources and pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And there's a lot of great solutions out there that don't involve like strange technologies, but just reducing the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we, we emit. And I think it's really about acting, speaking up and making our voices heard. So it's not an easy solution, but I think that's really what it is, so. Um, someone's asking about the amount of plastic and fading the seas. We aren't studying that, although there is a group that was up here using drones, using much more sophisticated drones. They're using fixed wing drones um, with some pretty sophisticated sensors to try to track plastic pollution up here, which like depressingly enough, there is plastic pollution up here too, because the plastic gets in the ocean and just disperses all over the globe. But what's that? You picked up some of it on the beach. I did. I actually picked up, we were, we were, um, we had gone off to to shore to do some drone flying and it was like a piece of like a long piece of blue plastic that we that we picked up but yeah it's there um so we're not studying it i don't really have any information about that but they're trying to use you know aerial surveillance aerial surveillance to try to to monitor what's going on there we are losing julie so i'll you know the three of us will, will try to hold hold on she has another meeting to go to someone's asking besides hiking what do we do for fun up there um we haven't actually had a lot of time to do other things. We've been doing a lot of work. Uh, it's a great question. Um, um, we do have a lot of fun out in the boats though, wouldn't you guys say? I yeah. was saying we eat croissants. We eat, it's food, it's, there's a lot of good food. So, um, but yeah, um, we are, we, we, we've done a little bit of hiking and, and that kind of thing, but um, will the team return again next year? It's uh, not this team, but um, you know, I know Julie is continually coming up here and you know, maybe probably not next year, but maybe in future years to, to continue monitoring it. Um, and thanks Janet for passing that uh, information on plastic debris there. And Meredith is asking what's on our agenda for remaining research days. We literally have one more day, one more field day because we leave on Thursday. Um, Wednesday is gonna be taken really packing up all of our equipment. Um, if anyone read my blog post about packing stuff up to get here. It's a whole product. We've got six large boxes full of scientific equipment. Um, it has to go through, it has to be shipped properly, go through customs. So it's going to take us probably half a day to do that. So we're hoping to have half a day to actually do some hiking, which would be great. Um, and, and then Thursday we leave. So it's been, it's been a, I can't believe the time is, is up. So you leave where, how did your route go when you go home? So, good question. We, we actually, so there, um, so we're on this archipelago called Svalbard. It's, it's a large island called Spitsbergen. And so there's actually a city called Longyearbyen, which is about a hundred miles south of here. Um, and that there's a major airport there. So we take a small, like, I don't know, it was a whole like 12 people. Yeah. On, it's like a 12 seater plane. We take that, they fly, um, 
two planes on Monday and two flights on Thursday, and that's it. And so we take the afternoon flight on Thursday. If the weather, hopefully the weather will cooperate. It's about a half hour flight to Long Bin. We stay overnight in Long Bin just because we're never quite sure what the weather's going to be like. Um, Long Bin's a, f- a fun little city to, to hang out for a night. Um, and then we fly to Oslo. We stay overnight in Oslo for, um, again, we sort of did that because of weather. And then on Saturday, we fly from Oslo to Boston. So it's really a three day, three day adventure. Fortunately, we've learned that we all get along with each other. So it's been, uh, we don't mind traveling with each other. So what's the coldness gotten? It's actually not been that cold here. I would say, I mean, it's, it's never gotten below freezing. Um, it was like 32 the day we got here. Yeah, I don't know if you guys heard that 32 the day we got here. Um, but out on the fjord, it's much colder. It feels much colder, even if the air temperature is 45 degrees, it can be windy. And of course we're on an ocean that is like maybe 37, 38 degrees water temperature um, and a boat that is not insulated, right? It's just a plastic boat. I mean, it's a very, when I say just a plastic boat, it's incredibly durable boats, but they're made out of hard plastic, which, you know, so you have a few inches of plastic between you and this really cold water. So uh, there have been some times, and I'll, I'll be honest and say, I probably didn't bring enough warm stuff up. I should have learned from last time, but um, there are some times when I have just had, just felt really cold out there on the fjord, even if the water, even if the air temperature is 45 degrees. Um, so, but um, Kelly has, has taught me how to wear at least three pairs of socks in my survival suit. And that's helped a lot. So. There was a bright meteor over Norway. I believe a couple there was days a what ago. a bright a bright meteor. In uh, the sky. Where is it? And I think debris yeah. landed somewhere in the vicinity of Oslo. Wow, that well, that's much farther yeah, south. But um, Max is asking what what time is it? It's nine thirty. It's uh, ten it's ten twenty now. So we're we're six hours ahead of Boston. So so right. th- thanks, Rachel. That was yes. Putting on the gear. If you haven't seen that video, it's kind of fun. But it's 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 it. it it's a whole production getting the, getting things on in the in the morning and so yeah. <laughs> Very good. Lots of lots of great questions. Thank you everybody be, for being so interactive there. Um, can I Janet? Can I just say you know uh, yes. the blog? The blog is a great place to continue asking questions. Um, just I think Janet put the put the link up, and I'll, I'll keep answering questions even when we after we get back, especially for my students who will probably you know if they're coming back from summer camp or whatever. Um, so I'll keep answering questions all summer long. So if you have other questions, feel free to reach out to me through the blog. Yep. And I'm posting it one more time at the bottom there. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Um, and, uh, like we mentioned at the beginning, um, we'll be also archiving this. So if you miss something or you want a clarity on a particular question, you might've missed it. Um, you'll be able to review the archive or share it with others that might not have been able to join. Um, I think. Looks like we got most of the good questions. So at this point, I think we'll kind of wrap it up. And if you're family or friends and want to say hello or whatnot after we're done recording here, you're welcome to stay on and uh, uh, chat with your family um, and say hello and such. So otherwise, thank you, uh, Mark. It was great hearing all about what it was like this time, 10 years later. I can't believe um, how much it's changed. It's really dramatic, but... um, I'm looking forward to following the rest of your journey as you move um, from doing science to packing and going home. And uh, it was great to uh, see Julie and meet the rest of your team. So 